I know uh, a couple of you were asking last class about the uh, midterm exam, and we are going to push that back. I just don't see any reasonable way of doing the things with the material that we currently have that I'd like to do. And I, I'm not really interested in uh, the, the quote unquote covering material. I don't think that's a useful way for us to spend our time. So I, I'd rather push back the exam rather than try to rush through this. This is too important uh, for you all as finance majors. So uh, we're looking at Google, which is uh, held by Alphabet Inc. That's the parent company of Google. And we've done some analysis and determined that it's overvalued. We have $200,000 of our own capital. So that is our net worth. Uh, the current price on Google is $2,000 per share. So we're going to use the information uh, that we learned in Chapter 2 to figure out how to capitalize on this expectation using the net worth that we currently have. And, of course, it shouldn't surprise you too much that the way to do that is through a short position. So we would open a short position in Google, which will give us a gain if the price goes down, which is consistent with our overvalued, overvalued expectation. However, on the flip side, it will give us a loss if a price continues upward. So let's look at that position. Um, here are our margin requirements. The initial margin is 50%. And suppose that on February 9th, um, we decide to short Google. Remember, we're using $200,000 of our own money. We have an initial margin of 50%. So think about that. Uh, you know, we've got margin is equal to 0.5 is equal to 200k over and always in the denominator is the value of the stock or value of the position if we're dealing with something other than stock but in this case we're we're going to be dealing with stock so this is simply the value of the stock pretty simple to do that math now obviously you'll you'll need to be able to do this even with strange initial margins and different uh, you know not as round of numbers in terms of net worth but obviously um, X ends up being 400k um, there we go and so we can buy or rather we can short up to four hundred thousand dollars worth of Google stock with our $200,000 of uh, net worth. And so the number of shares of Google stock that that translates to is the 400,000 total net position divided by $2,000 per share. So we are going to short 200 shares of Google stock. So that's our current position as of February 9th. All right. And then we uh, fast forward a couple of months to April 9th, and we look at uh, what's happened to the stock price. Current price is $2,100, so it's gone up by $100. And uh, again, just revisiting our initial margin of 50%, and maintenance margin is 30%. So, of course, one of the things we need to know is, are we going to get a margin call at this price? Uh, and first thing to figure that out is to get our percent margin as of April 9th, uh, when the stock price of Google is at 2100. Um, then we can answer that question. Another interesting thing that we should know, uh, and we should know this immediately when we open the position too, we can calculate at what price would we get a margin call because it's much simpler to watch as we're watching the price of Google. Uh, to know that if we hit this particular price on that day, we're going to need some liquidity if we want to keep the position open. And so to get the uh, percent margin, again, it's simply net worth over the value of the stock. Let me change the color of this uh, pencil here, if I can. Huh. Oh, sure. Right here. Mm -hmm. Sure, no problem. All right, so here we are. 
And so what is our percent margin? Um, again, it's net worth over value of the stock. Now, here's the trick, net worth. We started off with a net worth of 200,000, but that's not what we have now. And remember, one of, one of the easiest ways, I think, uh, or at least for me, is to think about this as a T account. And in the case of a short position, remember, what is it that is stated in terms of shares of stock? Is it the asset or the liability? Right. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, so the liability is 200 shares. Now, we can restate that at any point in time. We can restate that in dollar terms, given the price of, uh, of Google. So the asset is stated in terms of cash, and that's not going to change. So that's, that's a simple one. When we borrowed those 200 shares and sold them into the market, uh, they were worth $400,000. So that generated a cash flow of 400K. And then we put 200K of our money into this so that we would have some uh, skin in the game, if you will. So the total cash position on the asset side is 600K. That will not change unless we get a margin call, in which case it will then go up because we'll be depositing more cash into that, which will uh, will show up on the equity side and as well as on the uh, asset side. So right now, what is the value of this stock? Well, in dollar terms, it's uh, think of it as 200 shares times $2,100 gives us $420,000 of uh, stock that we'll have to replace at some point. So now we, we figure out, uh, so here's our, here's our 420. Um, 420 from 600K is what's left over for our equity. So that's 180K is our equity stake. So really this T account, if we just work through it and remember that in a short position, our liability is always stated in terms of shares. And that's the thing that's gonna vary. Our asset uh, side is stated in terms of cash and that's going to be constant unless there's a margin call. And obviously our equity position is assets minus liabilities. So we just calculate the value of the liability given the stock price, and we can easily get the, the equity stake here. Now that's effectively what this, this formula down here is doing as well. Um, we're taking the assets minus the value of the position, that's our net worth, divide it by the value of the position. But if, you know, if this T account works easier for you, if it makes more sense, please use it. Uh, for me personally, I, I like using that because I don't have to worry about what formula. The formulas get kind of, you know, you're just plugging and chugging and not thinking about the intuition behind this. So I think the T account brings, uh, brings some of that to light as well. Okay, so to get our margin, we simply take the net, val or the net worth divided by the value of the position and we get 42.85%. 42.85% is still greater than our maintenance margin, so we do not get a margin call yet. Now, what is the price to a margin call? Again, there is a formula, and remember here, if you're going to use the formula that gives you price, so it's already got price isolated on the left-hand side, um, there are two different formulas. One is for a short position. The other is for the long margin position. Just make sure you're using the right formula. All right. Both of those will be on the formula sheet for the midterm and they'll be labeled as such, but make sure you pick the right one. Don't just look at the first one and go, oh, here it is. Uh, plug and chuck. You'll get a wrong answer if it's for the other position. Uh, my preference is to simply, again, take our margin formula, which is, again, net worth over the value of the stock, and we can solve for P. We can set it up. We already know what the maintenance margin here is. It's 30%. We know what our 
our asset value is, it's 600,000. The value of the position is 200 shares times the price. So here's our unknown. The only thing that creates a little bit of a, a snag here is that we've got two unknowns in here, but that's fairly easy to solve with, uh, with the algebra. Um, so ultimately we can set it up where we've got, let me just write off to the side here, and you know, we've got the uh, 600 over 200p minus 200p over 200p. Right, so we can change that fraction to look like this, and we can see that since the numerator and the denominator are identical, that's how I get that one over there. Right, that's the only little trick there. Um, and then I have my my other part of the fraction here. I do a little reorganizing here in these next three steps, and isolate p over on the left hand side, and uh, get rid of the two hundred by dividing both sides by that and I solve for P and I get that 2307.69 is the price at which I would begin to get a margin call. So anything above 2307.69 will trigger a margin call. That will drop my margin down to 30%. If it continues above that price, my margin will continue to decline below 30%. Questions on that? You can certainly use the plug and chug formula if, if, you, if that's your preference, um, but I'm just showing you this as an alternative way to get to that same spot. Everybody okay with that? Really quick. Yeah. Um, where did that 600,000 come from? Ah, okay. Let me go back. Well, they, they, actually, let me uh, put the T account back up here. So... When we initially opened the position back in February, we borrowed those 200 shares and we sold them straight into the market. So that generated the 400,000. We also are required by the broker to deposit 200,000 into, into our account as our equity stake. So there's our 200K. So that shows up over here on the balance sheet, both in the equity side but also on the asset side, we add those two together and that's 600 K in cash in our account. The liability always stated in shares, but at the time we opened this, it was $2,000. And so that was 400 K. So the balance sheet balances, but the 600 K comes straight from there. Does that make sense? Sure, you're welcome. Any other questions? I can guarantee that this will be on the midterm. So, and especially the short position, it's weird. And, and Nathan, I think you bring up a, a good question there with that because it seems weird that we've got this 600,000 in cash on the uh, asset side of the balance sheet. Well, basically, the reason is is that our liability is stated in shares and that liability changes in value. So for the broker to have some security in their uh, their ability to offer us this position, we have to put some equity into it. So unlike the margin long position where the asset uh, is the shares themselves, and so the asset value, in if we had this set up, let me just show you. If this were a margin long position that we had opened up, we would have 200 shares of Google on the asset side. We would have borrowed $200,000 and that's the liability. And we would have put up 200,000 of our own money. So that's our equity piece of it. So here, if we translate this into dollars on the asset side, obviously it's 400,000. And it's this part that changes in a margin long position. So the asset varies in value in the margin long position. It's the liability though in the, in the short position that varies because that's what's stated in shares. 
So that's the key to this whole thing is remembering where are the shares. If it's a margin long, they're always the asset. If it's a short position, they're always the liability. Does that help? All right. Okay, so we've got a price. We know how high the price can go before we get a margin call. So we can kind of make sure that we have sufficient liquidity as the price approaches 2307. Now let's look at uh, a different problem. We're going to look at this as a margin long position as well. So let's say that uh, we go back in time to February 9th. We recheck our calculations and we discover, oh, wait a minute. It's not really overvalued. It actually turns out it was undervalued. Uh, good thing we checked our calculations. So what do we do to create a, a position that will maximize our return? Given that we don't have the capacity to trade in the futures market or options. Well, and the answer is we use a margin long position. So we borrow money to create some leverage. It's not quite as levered a position as a futures position or an options position, but it still does give us some leverage. The maximum leverage that our broker is able to give us is 50%. Now, obviously, there are some people who use credit cards or use bank loans, or I've even heard of students using student loans. Not a good idea. If you want to increase your leverage, yeah, you can do it. Uh, not recommended uh, by any stretch. Uh, so be careful about that. So uh, we open up our margin long position at uh, with $2,000 per share. Our initial margin is 50%. Our initial investment is the same amount that we did with the, uh, with the short position, 200,000. Now here we're adding in the money call rate and we're going to assume that the, uh, there, there is no additional uh, spread charged by our broker. So we just simply pay the money call rate. And by the way, that's simple interest per annum. That P-A uh, stands for per annum. So that means if we want to figure out what our monthly rate is, and in this case, we're actually holding our position for two months, we simply divide this thing um, by the appropriate number. So in, it, if we want to get the two-month simple interest rate, it would be 2%. Uh, usually, though, the broker will charge us uh, compounded monthly so the simple interest monthly rate is 1%. So that's our 12% divided by 12 uh, is 1% uh, per month. On April 9th, again, the price of Google ends up at 2100. And suppose we were to close out our position at that point. And the question is, what is your percent return? The only real trick here, two things, one, is remember what our percent return is based upon what we have invested, not the value of the position. All right. And since we're using margin, uh, we only have a fraction of what uh, the position costs to open. The other trick is to make sure that you don't forget the, uh, the cost of the uh, borrowings, the interest costs. And then we're going to get the annualized percent return. So the first thing we're going to do is get the periodic and then we'll annualize it. So on April 9th, we have 200 shares. We sell them at 2,100. That generates 42, uh, 420,000 in cash. So we subtract off the borrowing. So in other words, we're paying back our loan of 200,000. That leaves us with 220,000 that we get to keep, but then we still have to pay the interest and uh, at 200,000 uh, times uh, the 1% per month. Ooh, I see I made a mistake here. I needed to calculate that. That's my monthly rate. I need to double that. Uh, so I will go back and fix that. Um, that means that I'm actually, I've got interest costs of $4,000. So that should be. 216,000 in total. All right, so 216 minus 200. 
divided by 200. Let me uh, redo the math on that. And I get 0 0.08 or 8%. That's my periodic rate. Now, to get that in annualized terms, I want to compound this. So I'm going to take 1 plus the periodic rate. And there are six two month periods in a year. So I'm going to raise that to the sixth power. And then I'm going to subtract back out the one. Just for, uh, you know, a convenience sake, I always think of, don't forget this one here. Think of this as the print you're carrying along the principal uh, to compound. And then you've got to subtract that back out at the end. Uh, so that's uh, the way I in intuitively think about it. I mean, obviously, the formula is going to be on the formula sheet if you just want to plug and chug. All right, when we do that math, uh, 1.08 raised to the sixth power is 1.5868 minus 1. It gives us 0 0.5868 or 58.68%. So there's our annualized return. Any questions on that? Oh, because uh, we're, we're going from uh, February 9th to April 9th. And so we've got two months in there. And so there are six two month periods in, in the year. So if this were just one month, we'd raise it to the 12th. If this were a quarter, we'd raise it to the fourth. If this were a six-month period, we'd raise it to the second, and so on. Now, actually, the other the other piece of it, let's say it's longer than a year. Uh, we would raise it to one over the number of years. So if this were over a two-year period, uh, we would uh, raise that to the one-half power or take the square root of what's inside the parentheses. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Sure. Ah, right here. Um, that should have been two percent, right? Because we had one percent and, or excuse me, twelve percent per annum. Uh, divide by twelve months. That's one percent monthly. But we held the position open for two months. So scratch that two eighteen. I'll fix. I'll fix the slides, and uh, get them right when I upload these for you. Yes, the eight percent is the two month return. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and the, and it's good that we're going back over this because this is uh, the homework problem where the key was incorrect. Right? They they did it backwards in the key. Other questions or comments? All right, um, I'm just going to slip past this one because the incorrect answer is there. Like I said, I'll fix this before I upload it to Canvas. Um, okay, this the, these are more, uh, a, a couple of these are just uh, thought type problems. Um, so can somebody tell me one of the two fundamental ways in which options and futures differ from one another? And I would underline fundamental. This is kind of the, the key differences between them. Obviously, there's more than just two things that are different. That's true of, of, of an American style option. You're, you're right. Uh, a European style option, though, it, it's also just on the expiration date. So and, and while you're right, that is a, a, a difference between those. Uh, it turns out that it's not 
really all that critical because for the most part, you never exercise. Well, here I am saying for the most part, you never No, <laughs> Most of the time you do not exercise an option early because it has more value alive than, than exercise. So uh, while I agree that is a difference, I wouldn't categorize it as one of the key or fundamental differences. But good, good uh, start. Um, is it that an option gives the buyer or seller the, um, the op or a futures is the obligation and an option is the yeah. decision to buy or sell? Yep. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So the future commits you to the position regardless. Now, you can still reverse that prior to uh, delivery by taking the opposite position and they, they cancel one another out effectively. But you still have, it, it, at the time you make the decision to either go long or short in the futures contract, that's it. An option, if you're buying the option, you never have to ever exercise it. You can just crinkle it up, toss it in the wastebasket, and no one will worry about it. Particularly the counterparty, if the value is uh, negative for them. <laughs> So uh, they would love that. But it, the, the point is, is that if you're the buyer of the option, you have the right but not obligation to either buy in the case of a call or to sell in the case of a put. So that's, that's one of them. Absolutely right. Thanks, Spencer. How about the other one? Pardon me. Let me silence my phone here. Go ahead and just unmute and shout out if you uh, have an idea. There you go. That's, yep. So from a theoretical standpoint, you can open up a futures contract with absolutely zero cash flow. Now, in practice, you're going to be required to put some margin up. You're going to be required to put some... Uh, skin in the game so that if price moves against you and the broker has to close you out, they don't lose money, only you lose money. So there is a margin, but really you're not paying for that position, you're paying for any potential future losses. Whereas in an option, you pay a premium if you're the buyer. Uh, in the option, if you're the seller, you actually receive a premium. So there is an actual cash flow at the beginning of an option contract, whereas there is not a, uh, a premium or payment at the beginning of a futures position. This one actually uh, pertains quite uh, nicely to the, uh, the GameStop uh, situation. So here we've got the liquidity of an asset directly affects the risk of buying or selling that asset during adverse market conditions. Describe the liquidity risk, that is the risk of owning a stock that has a relatively low trading volume that you face in the, with a long position during a market decline. And then the converse is with a short position during a market rally. And obviously that is the GameStop situation. What kind of risks do you face? Let's take the long position to start with. During a market decline, what, what's driving the decline in the market price? Back to fundamentals, Econ 101, demand and supply. I, I couldn't hear very well, Paul. Say, say that a bit louder. Yeah, and uh, lack of demand, absolutely. And, and or it could be an excess of supply. Right. And so we have too many sellers relative to buyers. So we're lowering the price continually until we find the point of the, the price point where the buyers equals the sellers. So if price is declining and we are long that position, what what would we like to potentially do? Well, if we've set a target price to get out at, we'd like to sell at some point. What are we doing? We're actually piling onto the sell side. We're already piling into a, an overheated 
supply of that of those shares. Whereas in the short position, the opposite thing is happening. If we have a short position and prices going up, we're losing money. Every dollar the price goes up, we're losing more and more money. In order to stop those losses, we have to buy. And remember, the reason the price is going up is because there are more buyers than there are sellers. There's a disequilibrium in the uh, in the two counterparties. So that's the the risk that we face. And this is particularly true in stocks that don't have much liquidity, stocks that normally don't trade too much. And maybe it's just that there isn't a lot of interest or a lot of trading in those stocks, or maybe there isn't a lot of free float. And we talked about free float the other day in the context of the GameStop situation, right? Free float are the number of shares that are truly available to be traded at any given point in time. Some shares are tied up in, uh, in, in uh, you could think of it as, uh, we're talking about S&P 500 companies. There's anywhere from 10, 12, I don't know what the current number is today, could even be 13 or 14% of those shares in total are tied up in index mutual funds or ETFs. Those funds are not going to sell those shares. So right off the bat, you just take those off the table. Those are not uh, shares that would ever go into the marketplace. So our free float is reduced by 10 or 12 or 14%, whatever that figure is at the time. I know historically it's varied between about 9 and 12%. My guess is that it's a bit higher even today than that percentage. There are more people uh, buying into uh, index mutual funds and ETFs. So that's the kind of risk that we face. That's a liquidity risk is how I would term that. And... Um, Oh, sorry, uh, Zachary, a question? So, in the case of them being locked up in ETFs, if you're looking at one that like, tracks the Dow Jones or the S&P, if a new company gets added to one of those indexes, would that create a lot of demand for those shares? Yes. <laughs> Funny you should ask that. I have a paper about that that I published oh back in the early 2000s. There's there's a fair amount of literature around that as well. Um, the answer is yes, absolutely. And those uh, stocks do change out fairly frequently. It varies from exchange to exchange. The study that I did uh, actually focused on the S&P 500 because the S&P 500, unlike some of the other indices, is not an index that is just based upon, say, market value of a company. So some of, say, the Russell 2000 or the Russell 1000, that's simply a calculation. So they calculate the market value of the company, and if it's the top 1,000 market value companies, it's in the Russell 1000. The S&P 500 is a little bit different. The Standard & Poor's company has a committee that determines the appropriate 500 stocks to have in that index. And their target is to mirror what's going on in the U.S. economy. And so it's not, it's not simply based on market cap. There may be some companies in the S&P 500 index that are not among the top 500 market cap companies, but they have a better representation of the U.S. economy as a whole. Now, clearly, many of them are, especially the S&P 100. Uh, most of those companies are also the highest market cap companies, the highest 100 market cap companies. So when they do make a change, um, yeah, there's, there's quite a bit of demand. So what Zachary was picking up on here is that if mutual funds and ETFs hold 10 to 14-ish percent, of the, uh, of the value of the S&P 500 firms, if we add a new firm, those, those mutual funds and those ETFs are going to eat up 10 or 14% of those shares. So a couple of things happen. Um, in order to be listed, the S&P, one of the decisions that they make is, is there enough free float? to allow for that sort of reduction in free float uh, based upon the, the demands from the mutual fund and ETF industries. And if the answer to that is yes, then that company becomes a candidate for inclusion in the S&P 500. Um, obviously, they also look at a number of other factors, uh, amount of volume of trade in a daily basis. Is it representative of the US economy as a whole and so on and so forth. So when they add that in there, there's this immediate demand, 
because, and, and again, here's the other key thing that you may not be aware of. These mutual funds and ETFs that track something like the S&P 500 index, their goal is not to, not to outstrip the index in terms of returns, but to very closely mirror that index. And the way we measure that is with what's called a tracking error. So what they're, what they're trying to do is minimize that tracking error to as small an error as possible. That's their goal. So most of these mutual funds and ETFs are what are called full replication index indexers. That means that they don't just hold a subset of the firms. They hold all 500. So when that firm gets added, there's an extra 10 or 15 or 14% demand on the day of addition. Now, what, what S&P has taken to do, and this, this occurred, I want to say, back in the late 90s. Originally, they would announce it at the cl after the close of market one day, and it would become effective the open of the next day of the market. They thought that that was contributing to volatility in the price of the added shares or the added companies. So they've taken to now pre-announcing this thing. And so they pre-announce it uh, up to a week or two weeks in advance. And they announce the day they're actually going to add it. So that gives these indexers an opportunity to find the shares. So they'll, they'll make arrangements with their, with their brokerage houses to, to find the sufficient number of shares so that they can add those to their portfolio. The odd thing that happens, though, is that not only is there an announcement day price rise in the shares that get added, but there's another price rise between the day of the announcement and the day of addition, and then there's yet a third price rise on the actual day of addition, of, of, of addition which seems counterintuitive because originally the S&P was trying to do this to prevent and minimize price volatility and the and the price what I call what we call price pressure and that's demand and supply driven things not fundamentals anything that's driven by simply supply and demand but doesn't relate to the fundamental value of something we call a price pressure and so it appears that the price pressure is actually even higher now that they've taken to pre-announcing this um, anyway it, it I can I can give you some sites on some of the literature there, but it's an interesting effect. Now, don't try to make money off of this. It's <laughs> now you would obviously you can't capture the announcement return. Um, well, I take that back. There's there are potentially ways of doing this. You can guess which firms might be included and hold a portfolio of those firms. But what you could actually get are the returns between the announcement and the addition day and the addition day, and then close out your position. That's still fraught with a lot of error. While we looked at hundreds of these things, and we found that on average, there were positive and abnormal returns, any individual addition is going to uh, potentially uh, you know, perform differently. So this is averaged over a, a wide number of years and hundreds of uh, additions to the S&P 500. Anyway, sorry I got off track there, but good question, Zach. Um, thanks for that. And uh, so the, the yep the the answer to this uh, price pressure thing is yeah there is price pressure. By the way, the 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 takeaway from the paper that I published on that is that the NYSE was better at mitigating this price pressure uh, than stocks that traded on the Nasdaq. In fact, that was the whole point of our paper was looking at which market did a better job of mitigating the, the price pressure effects. Okay, other questions on any of this so far? All right, so the next problem uh, looks at this table. And so we've got uh, ECI, it's Eric Cartman Inc. And we have a current stock price of $20.25. And we have a variety of call and put options here and strike prices, the expiration dates, volume for the calls, last price for the calls, volume for the puts, and the last price uh, for the 
uh, for the puts as well. So the question is, there are two premiums here that can't possibly be, be correct, or at least on the surface of it, look to be incorrect. Can you tell me just one of those two? If you remember our discussion about intrinsic value, this goes back to intrinsic value. Let's also further assume, just for simplicity's sake, it's not a necessity that we that we have this uh, assumption, but let's assume that these are American style options. So you could exercise at any point in time. Which options appear to be mispriced? I would say the second one. Okay, uh, let's see. Second, uh, so second strike price, Brad? Yes. And is it call or the put? The call. Okay. So right, the seven dollars. Okay. Anybody else? What's a call give you the right but not obligation to do if you bought it? You get to buy a round lot. Okay. So you get to go out and buy the stock at the strike price. Now, if you were to do that and then immediately turn around and sell it into the market at the market price, the market price is $20.25 right now. So another way to look at this is, where could I make an immediate profit? And I'll tell you, there's uh, the, the call is a little easier to think about in, in terms of this. What's your, what's your net buy price? for I don't know let's take the let's take the the $15 call here if I were to buy that call that would cost me and let's just do this on a per share basis uh, we know that the actual contract is for a hundred shares but we can do the same thing just on a per share basis and get the right answer so if I were to buy this call it would cost me seven dollars to buy one shares worth of call and that particular call gives me the right to buy ECI at $15 from the counterparty in the call, from the seller of the call. So my net cost to buy ECI is 15 plus 7. So my net all-in price is $22. Now, if I were to immediately turn around and sell that to the market, at the market price, I would lose $1.75. So that price is probably, I, I can't tell you that that price is exactly right, but the price certainly could be right. It's not prima facie wrong. Now, is there another call in there that is completely wrong though, that would allow me to make a profit immediately? Yeah, it would. Yeah, thank you, Paul. So I could buy that option for $5.50. That option gives me the right but not obligation to buy the stock for $10. So I'm into that for $15.50. The current price is $20.25. So I make a uh, $4.75 gain right off the bat. That's a mispricing. Clearly that price, that premium is too low. Now, actually anything above the exercise, uh, it, it, any exercise price above the current stock price for the call uh, is completely out because we could, we, we would never exercise in that case. Uh, not to mention the fact that we're paying five bucks to get a $25 call. That's $30 all in. So any exercise price above the current stock price, we can ignore. So that actually only left us with these two. Now, what about the, uh, the puts here? 
So the reverse is true of the puts. Any put with a exercise price below the stock price is out. So we can scratch those off right off the bat. We don't have a price for the $25 put. We don't have a price for the $35 put. We do have a price, though, for the $30 put. And it turns out, actually, that one is also appears to be mispriced. And here's how, the, here's how that works. Remember, the put gives the buyer of the put the right but not obligation to sell at the exercise price to the counterparty. How could I make money out of this? Well, this, this particular put right here gives us, even though I've scratched over that, sorry, um, gives us the right but not obligation to sell at $30. Now we've paid $8.75 for that right. So that means that net of the premium, we have the right to sell for $21.25. Current stock price is $20.25. So we could immediately go out, buy one share for $20.25, turn around and immediately sell it into the option for $21.25 and make a dollar. So clearly, again, the premium on this option is, is way too low by at least a dollar. And now the details in, in terms of why, the, why you might observe this, and I'm here to tell you, if you go out and look at some option prices right now, today, you're very likely to find these. Do not, whatever you do, do not try to buy those things. The reason is, is that these prices could be stale. In other words, this price of $5.50, it should be at least uh, $10.25. That would negate any immediate exercise. But that price could have been from two days ago. Or even this morning. And the market price is constantly changing. We don't constantly have updates in the prices of our, of our options. Those markets are nowhere near as liquid as the underlying securities. So this price could be very old. If we looked for a current price, we might find that it's $11. And then there's obviously no particular gain. Now, you still might want to buy the option. But what I'm here to tell you is that we could actually observe these prices in the real world not recognizing that there's a mismatch between the timing of the stock price and the last premium that was paid. All right. So, and, and this also gives you a, a little bit of an exercise in thinking about what an option gives you the right but not obligation to do and, and when it would be beneficial to hold one. So there's, and then there's our put, the $30 put. Now, here's uh, another quote sheet. Um, this is for Apple stock. And down the middle, we've got the exercise price. On the left side, we have the calls. On the right side, we have the puts. The area in the blue, uh, so in the case of the calls, that's from here on up. In the case of the puts, that's from here on down. Those just help us to see which of these uh, options are in the money. So the puts with the exercise price above the current stock price of 201.77, any of those are in the money. Uh, any below that uh, price on the call side are in the money. And then here we have the bid price, the ask price, and the last trade for the calls, and we have a corollary over here on the put side. Now, the bid and the ask are the quotes that the broker has made. That's the price at which the broker will buy and the price at which they will sell, which means that for us, on the other side of those transactions, the, if the bid price is the price at which the broker will buy, that's the price at which we will sell. So we are always, if we're, if we're selling an option, we're always facing the broker's bid. If we're buying the option, we're always facing the broker's ask price. And uh, so that's always going to be higher for each of these options. 
So here's the question to you all. Um, using the $220 call, so we are right here, and we're on the call side. Um, how much would a long position for 2,000 shares cost? So first, what's the premium? And then secondly, uh, at what price would Apple need to reach for you to make a 50% gain on that particular position? And the key there is to remember that the gain is based upon the price we pay for the premium, not based upon how much it costs us to actually exercise that option. All right, so we're at the $220 exercise price. So we've got a bid price of $2.82 and an ask price of $2.85. Which of those prices applies if we're buying the call? The ask price. Right. Thanks, Noah. So $2.85. We're buying at the ask. We sell at the at the bid. So 285 times 2,000 shares. Let's look at that. It gives us a price of $5,700 to buy those contracts. And that would actually be, what, 20 contracts? 100 shares per contract. And we want to buy 2,000 shares worth of contracts. So that's 20 total contracts. Um, now, the question of at what price would Apple need to reach for you to make a 50% gain? Let's go back to this quote sheet. All right. We know that the exercise price on this thing is 220. So any price below 220 is going to lead to a 100% loss for us. Right? Because we would never exercise, we'd never go out and buy shares of Apple for $220 when the market price is below $220. And right now it's at $201.77. So the feasible subset of prices where we would have the potential of making money are above $220. And we know that they're actually a little bit further up than $220 because just a penny above 220, uh, we're just offsetting the cost of our premium. So we would still have a negative return in that case. In fact, we would have a negative return right up to and including what price? A negative or zero return. No, it's going to be higher than that. Because we remember we want to recoup our premium. That's our investment. I know you guys know this. Just somebody, somebody say the number. It's right there in front of you. Yeah, sorry, it may be small and some, yeah, let me, uh, let me blow that up a little bit. Hopefully that helps. Where would I break even? Where would I have a zero return? Where would I recoup my premium cost? You can do this on a per share basis. It's simpler to do it on a per share basis. That'll apply for whether we have 2,000 shares or 20,000. How much did we pay for this? $2.85, right? So that's what we have to get back. So we get to, remember, here's the mechanism. We get to buy this thing from the counterparty for $220. If the market price is above $220, then we would make some sort of gross profit. So let's say it was $221. Well, then we'd make a dollar on every share. That only partially recoups our $2.85 cost. 
What if it were 222? Well, we'd make $2 per share. We're still short 85 cents. So actually, it turns out that it's the exercise price plus the premium. So $222.85 is our break-even point. Anything above $222.85, we start making money. So in order to have a 50% return, 50% of what? Well, 50% of the original $5,700 cost. So let's let's work that out. Here's recouping our capital. That's the one. And then the 0.5 obviously is our 50%. So we would need a total uh, gain of $8,550. And if we divide that by our 2,000 shares, just to keep the, the, the thought process, the intuition simple, let's get it on a per share basis. On a per share basis, it means that the price would have to be $4.27.5 above the exercise price. So, simply put, at two twenty four twenty seven and a half, we would have a 50% gain on that option. Does that make sense? Sort of, kind of, I hope. You've still got a couple of weeks if it doesn't quite make sense. Because, again, the reason we're going over this in class is that I can guarantee you, you're going to see these problems on the midterm. Uh, by the way, I will be posting this, too, if you want to go back and, and review these. So they'll be up on Canvas. All right. So let's... Uh, so again, back to table six, uh, or uh, back to the table from problem six, sorry. Um, we want to compare percentage returns based upon a margin investment, where we have an initial margin of 50%, versus an option investment, where we have a heck of a lot more leverage. Uh, so we're going to use that same $220 call we're going to assume that we're buying the stock at $201, just throwing off the pennies just to make the math a little simpler. Um, so if Apple is selling at 222 on the expiration date of the option, the question is, is what is our return if we're in a margin long position versus the option position? And then also we'll look at the same two returns if the price of Apple is at 225 instead of 222. I'm just going to walk through this fairly quickly and you can always go back and I'd recommend reviewing the math and making sure that you can replicate this. But for the long margin investment, we purchase at 201, but remembering that we're using 50% borrowed money. So our net capital invested, our net worth is only $100.50. So that's the basis on which we compute our returns. That's in the denominator. And so a $222 price minus the initial price paid means that we have on a per share basis a $21 total gain and 21 as a percent of the initial investment of our net worth of $100.50 is 20.89%, and that's a gain. Now, if we look at the option investment, here our invested capital is the premium that we pay, and on a per share basis, we pay $2.85 for that option. Um, so the total premium cost on one contract would be $2.85. The gross gain from that would be 222 minus the 220. So we'd exercise. And when we exercise, we buy at 220 and we sell back to the market at 222. So we make $2 on every share times our one contract, our 100 shares. That's a $200 uh, gross profit. However, it costs us 285 to buy that position. So we have a loss of $85. And so our return, again, our net investment, our net worth, if you will, is 285. 
and our return is a loss of $85. So that means we had a negative 29.82% return. So look at that variation between these two, right? Pretty significant. Now we just raised the price by $3. So we already know that the return on our margin long position, it's gonna go up, but not by a whole lot. What's gonna be interesting is when we see what happens to the option position. It goes from a almost negative 30 up to almost a, I think it hits close to a positive 30%. So here at 225, let's go through the same set of numbers. Um, again, we buy at 201. We only have half of our money invested in this. We borrow the other half. We have $24 in total, and that equates to a return of just a shade under 24%, 23.88. The option investment, same option, same exercise price, same premium. Um, we could do this on a per share basis too. Uh, rather than on a one contract basis, whatever whatever works. Since we're only looking at returns at the end of the day, doesn't matter. Um, so we have our 285 cost. Our gross profit on that is $500. And so that leaves us with a 215 to the good. And on an investment invested, oh, sorry, it's not 30, it's 75%. Uh, so two, 215 gain on a $285 initial investment um, is 75.5% almost. So obviously there's a whole lot more leverage embedded in these options. That, you know, that could be a good or a bad thing, right? Depending upon what you're trying to achieve. If you want to create a much riskier position, that's, the options are the way to go. If you're concerned about riskiness and vo price volatility, definitely don't buy an option. And let's see, finally here, uh, we're gonna look at a futures uh, contract and we're gonna speculate on a corn contract. Um, we're going to use the December 2020 contract and the last quoted price to do this exercise. Uh, if the price in December were 360 apostrophe two. And remember when we talked about these futures contracts, that apostrophe is fractions of a penny and the 360 are pennies. So that's $3.60 plus and 60 cents plus two eighths of a penny or one quarter of a penny. So $2.6025 per bushel. So when that contract expires, that's what we're going to base this on. Hang on a second, and I'll get to the next slide, which has the uh, quotes in it. But remember that 360 apostrophe 2. That's the price at expiration. All right, so here we are, our December contract. Um, it currently is uh, uh, selling at $3.00. And 51 and a half cents. So that's the 351 apostrophe four. That's four eighths of a penny. Uh, there are 5,000 bushels in the contract. And so to do the math here, if the ending price in December is 360, and remember we're going long, and we agreed to buy at $3.515 per bushel. That means that we can immediately turn around and sell at the market price in December of $3.6025 per bushel. So there's a gain of uh, eight and three quarter cents per bushel times the 5,000 bushels in a contract. So a $437.50 gain in that position. That's pretty much it for the uh, exercises out of chapters two and three that I wanted to review with you all. See that we're getting really close to uh, the end of class. So we'll, we'll have to pick up on the exercises for chapter five and six on Thursday. And then we'll also be getting into the lecture on chapter five. Um, let me go back to this and uh, bring myself back up to 
full size. Okay, so um, one thing, one other thing I wanted to mention to you all is that I, a number of you uh, found that the grades in Canvas did not update immediately when you were doing exercises. Everybody who emailed me, I checked your grades in Connect, and they showed up. So if others of you have seen that sort of thing happening, where you've done the exercise, you've submitted it in Connect, but and you go back into Canvas and it doesn't show the grade, go back in and look in Connect and make sure that it shows that you've uh, you've done the exercise. I found that to be 100% the case of those of you that have emailed me. So um, I'm, I'm not sure why they're not updating, why Canvas is not updating immediately. Maybe they run some sort of batch. Um, it's supposed to be full integration between the two. I'm not sure that <laughs> that full integration is giving us real-time updates on the grades. So if you know that you submitted it and you're quite sure of that, um, don't worry if Canvas doesn't update. I'm going to use the connect uh, values no matter what. So that's uh, homework. Um, also, uh, update on the um, Bloomberg. I, I know that uh, the apparently the lab is not been open on the weekend so if any of you were trying to get in on the weekend that didn't work i'm working with the dean's office and the administration and uh tech uh folks oops daisy to uh try to fix that problem and get us open on uh the weekend as well as evening sorry battery power ran out on me I'll fix that momentarily So uh, hopefully we'll have similar um, uh, hours to what you had in the upstairs lab. At least that's my goal. Um, we've got to work things out with uh, administration and IT to make sure that you have access. So, uh, But if you are entirely remote, uh, keep trying to get in on the, uh, on the remote login. If you have any problems, make sure you contact Bloomberg and or me, but uh, don't don't let many more days go by. I know I had set a deadline of this past weekend, but with the problems that we had in terms of getting you all into the physical terminal, um, obviously that's that I, I'm not going to hold anybody to that deadline. But do make a credible attempt to get in there, get your accounts set up. I see that a few more of you have set up Bloomberg uh, Market Concept accounts. So that's moving in the right direction, but I need to see more than an, uh, single digits of you in there. Don't forget that deadline is, is going to come up quickly. It's March 14th uh, to get those first three modules done. Other than that, I think that's it from me. Any questions before we wrap up? Can I ask you about my situation after? Oh, sure. Yeah, I'll stick around. Sure. Absolutely. I'll stick around. Anything else? All right. I'll see the rest of you on Thursday.